Hello and welcome to episode 24 of the Large Format Photography Podcast. My name is Simon Forster and I'm joined by Andrew Bartram and Sam Heiser in Holliston, Massachusetts. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Simon. Hello, Sam. Simon. Yeah, <laughs> it's great to have you here, Sam. Um, okay, now, uh, before we get going, I just want to say thank you to Travis Linville for being a great guest with us last week. So uh, um, if you've not heard that show, well worth um, heading heading back to that and have a listen to, uh, to Travis. So first thing, it's been a while since we've been on again. Um, so I uh, do, do apologise for that. It's uh, largely due to the jet-setting uh, life of Andrew. So what, what have you been up to lately? And please explain yourself. <laughs> well, first of all, we didn't have Travis on last week. It was probably three three weeks yes. ago. Good point. And, uh, but we'll forgive you. Uh, well, apart from travelling to dangerous parts of the world and, you know, exposing myself to Italians who may or may not have coronavirus and then getting back late on Thursday and it was all getting a bit difficult so we we postponed the show with Sam to uh, to today so, so you you are actually self quarantining at the moment aren't you well not really no i mean the advice is um the advice is really if you show symptoms you're supposed to self quarantine but i think well can't i be carrying it even if i'm not showing symptoms so i'm taking that cautious approach and uh, just keeping away from people you know not uh, not having um putting myself in big crowds of people like so i'm meeting up with uh, Rene vonk from the netherlands tomorrow and i was going to pick him up from the airport but i said look it's probably best if i don't pick you up from the airport and you know he's got an elderly father who's got lung problems so i don't want to risk um you know killing somebody in holland um so i'll just keep you know i won't kiss anybody which is a great shame you know because i like kissing people and I won't, uh, I won't touch anybody. I'll just keep my distance, and you know. But I think I'm okay. Good. It's been, it's been about nine days now. So, um, uh, since since I was first there, and seven since eight since I came back. So we'll see, you know. And uh, my wife isn't treating me too much like a leper, but just a little bit. <laughs> But, you know, she's happy for me to cook for her, so she can't be that fussy. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, 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 other, the other side is, I mean, there's, there's a, we nearly didn't have this podcast to, going out today because we <laughs> yeah. were going to do this. Well, to, today is Friday. What was the date today? 6th of March. Yeah, Friday the 6th. Uh, we were going to be at uh, Dave Shrimpton's place. Um, yeah. doing a, a bit of a day with him doing dry plates and wet plates and all all, mm -hmm. all wonderful plates and things like that um but uh yeah your uh, your current potential health conditions or sort of, we decided to like knock that one on the head because uh, mm -hmm. we, can, we can do that another time but that yep. did enable us to reschedule and have have sam with us so that's that's great news excellent so tell us apart from avoiding viruses and things what, what you've been up to since since you were last here I've been doing quite a bit of darkroom work, but not printing large format negatives. I'm working on my prints from USA 2016. But uh, so I've been enjoying getting back in the darkroom. And because, as I mentioned before, I've now got a box of Jason's drive plates. Uh, I'm getting into lenses that don't have shutters because I figure, well, ISO 2, I can you know, if it's a bit overcast, it's probably going to be um, a second or so or, or slower. I can manage that. So I bought a new lens and I did I did mention this to you. I said, what do you think of this, Simon? You said, I have no idea. So I bought an Indostar 37, which apparently is a Tessar copy. Now, is a Tessar four element three groups? I've no idea. I read that somewhere. Or is it three groups and four elements? It's well. It's one of those. It's usually four elements, at least. Anyway, I'm not, not four not elements three, yeah. in three groups. I think. Anyway, this lens apparently, and it looks really nice. It's got a retaining ring, and uh, it's very clean looking, and it stops down to f sixty four, f four point five wide open. It's focal length of three hundred millimeters, and it was designed for the use on uh, big Russian cameras, big wooden box things. Soviet large format wooden camera FK or FKD. They, I don't know whether they're all 18 by 24, but certainly I'm looking at one 18 by 24, which has actually got an Indostar 51 on it. But 
in the blurb for my lens, it says, it's, you know, these big wooden Russian cameras from the 50s. Uh, this is typically the kind of lens uh, lens that was on there. So I'm very excited. That's going to be delivered next week sometime. And I uh, didn't pay an awful lot of money for it. Well, I didn't think I paid an awful lot of money for it. It looks a very clean, um, you know, clean cop uh, version. And it was made in the Konz factory. Have I got that right? I think it was made in the Konz factory. Well, K- K- K-O-M-Z. Mm, maybe. Something like that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, was, oh, yeah, I've got the page back now. Yeah, made in the comms, K-O-M-Z-Z, yeah. Z, in deference to Sam. Uh, yeah, so it said it was the lens that was principally used with 18 by 24 FK and FKD cameras. So 18 by 18 and 24, are you, are you talking? Centimetres. I was, I was going to say, yeah. So what, what's that What's that in old money? I don't know. Let's get a ruler out. So what, was that? what was that, Sam? Not that big. It's, it's um, 9 to 12 centimetres. It's 4 by 5 in Germany. So yeah, so 18 centimetres is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 inches. That's 18. And 24 centimetres is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 10, so... 10 by yeah. 7. Yeah, and so, that lens, that'll, that'll be fine. Uh, I'm going to use it on my 4 by 5, and I had a push if I ever get an 8 by 10, um, use it on yeah, that. It would probably work in an 8 by 10 with a little bit of vignetting. Yeah, but, I'll do a Sally Man, you see? I'll have a lens that doesn't quite take any movements, and I'll get a bit of vignetting. Yeah, you use your old top hat. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, that was one of the disappointing things about not getting to Dave Shrimpton's uh, workshop because he uses a, he uses a, in fact he uses a bowler hat for his uh, <laughs> to to expose his uh, images. So that's me. So I'm quite excited about this, and because I'm going to use it for paper negatives and dry plate initially photography. I think shutters are overrated, personally. Pause for you to say something. Hello, is any of you there? <laughs> I, uh, I, was, I was wondering if Sam was going to say something there, so I was, I was, I was, I was pausing for Sam. Yeah, they were um, shutters. They're they're complicated. They are, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that's me really. Um, apart from so darkroom work, which I've been really enjoying getting back in the darkroom. I bought myself a set of cheap under the lens filters because my uh, despite being serviced by odyssey devere um, yeah the the it's still, the the color head on my devere 504 still leads to some really long exposure so uh, if i cut those out and just use under the lens filters then uh, i get into more reasonable times and it's easier for split grade printing as well you talk talk about under the lens filters. I, that's something that I've learned to my cost, and I'm not sure if I've mentioned this on the podcast. But we've got some old uh, Jessup's uh, filters, aren't they? Like 90 millimeter square uh, for, mm-hmm. for our large formats and larger at the Six Times Darkroom, where we meet every Tuesday night and come along um, in Stoke on Trent. And the uh, th- apart from the fact that two of the filters. I've already have been cut down, so therefore they won't fit the filter holder that, that I've made. Uh, that's a that's a bit of a blow. Um, but the other thing is that they they're filthy, and I decided to do the the sensible thing when you have a piece of plastic that's a bit dirty and you're trying to shine an image through it. So you want it to be as clean as possible. I ran it under the tap, and I had, this was before I read the instructions to say don't get it wet. Um, mm. And and it's a case of it appears that these these filters are uh, they must be clear plastic and then they have a sprayed uh, <laughs> pink well, they did magenta have. exactly it was, as I was running it under the tap it, it, it was going pink well, the water was and my hands were going pink it's like you're developing a roll of T-Max maybe or something is it T-Max that's pink I think it might be <laughs> made in Germany <laughs> uh, so um so yeah so uh so remember kids um uh, if you do have have some jessup's contrast filters don't get them wet um, so. you're such a cheapskate you're a, you, i know you live in stoke-on-trent but you're a lucky yorkshireman <laughs> sorry to alienate all our yorkshire listeners but uh just get yourself i keep telling you stop all this nonsense about 3d printing things just to save a few bob 
and go and get some under the lens filters. No, no, Mr. no. You don't no. normally get a bargain from Mr. Cad, uh, but I did get a. He, he sent me some. Uh, I think I paid twenty three quid delivered, and uh, he tried to pull a fast one. The first time he sent me a set from the nineteen seventies, you know, like those old ones that don't go up to just a zero to five multi grade, probably made for multi grade three or something. So I sent him a terse twit tweet back and saying, "Wait, don't want these." <laughs> So he sent me the proper ones. <laughs> I think mi- Mr. Cad uh, by name. <laughs> well, just just thinking about that, I think that's the kind that I, w- I was using and trying to use. But um, I, I, I will actually get some proper filters. It's okay. So if I've got, it's one of those things. If you've got something and you think it's going to work, give it a chance. Mm. And mm. if it doesn't work, then you know move up to the next level. Mm. Uh, but it's a case of the. I just need to get the filters because there's, there's nothing wrong with the the my 3D printed uh, filter holder. It works perfectly and it swings mm-hmm. out of the way. It, it does everything you want it to do. So that that bit's okay. Um, I just need to get some new um, actual filters, and I will buy some new ones. Assuming I can, you can get them in. They do still make them in 90 mil square, don't they? Yeah, you can get them fairly easily. I think Ex- exactly. So uh, yeah, so I, I will get some of those um, and. I th- if I just hijacked you, I can't remember if you... Probably. Did. What have you been up to then? Is that what you've been up to? Yeah, yeah. well, I've been doing things with uh, 3D printed and content. And of course filters. you have. Um, but on top of that, uh, this weekend, um, there was a camera fair near me and mm. I bought a fair bit of stuff. Um, and for those people that don't know that much about me, I buy and sell camera equipment as, as, as my day job. And when I go to a camera fair, I I'm far more interested in buying things and selling things uh, because you can, you can pick up some good deals, but I've, I've got a weakness for wanting to buy things that I want to use rather than buying things specifically to sell, especially when it comes to large format equipment. And um, somebody I, I knew there, one of the dealers, he, go, he sort of, as I'm walking past, it sort of gives me the look and I'm thinking, I know what that look means. And uh, so I had headed over there and uh, and he pulled out from under the table, uh, a, you know, a huge um, aluminium uh, flight case thing, mm-hmm. and uh, popped it open there. And hey presto, there was a, a Toyo four x five monorail camera in there. And because uh, you need another monorail camera, don't you? Clearly, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> I've only got a, I've only got a Cyan RF two. So, yeah. So, so I, you need another monorail. Ex- if I was going to advise you, I wouldn't have advised you to buy another monorail camera. But anyway, go ahead. Well, the the, the thing is, though, um, well, yeah, it, also, he also, he also had a 75 millimeter rodent stock uh, for mm-hmm. sale as well, which obviously I had to buy that. Mm-hmm. Um, go, goes without saying. But I bought the, 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 the Toyo. And, and it's a case of I'm, I'm certainly have no intention of keeping um, the sign art and to- the Toyo. Toyo or Toyo? Oh, uh, oh, I don't know. Is it Toyo? I don't know. Sam, what do you reckon? Toyo. Yeah. Toyo. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. It's not a yo-yo. Toyo. <laughs> Toyo. Okay. Toyo. Okay. I'll, I'll, so, the amount of times I've been picked up on my pronunciation for, for obscure Japanese uh, items uh, is untrue. So, Toyo. Well, the Japanese aren't listening today. No, no. Um, They're all in quarantine. <laughs> um, so, Toyo. Um, and th- it's, our, uh, it's our darkroom club. Uh, uh, Robert, uh, it's our darkroom club. He picked up a, a Toyo, 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 oh. um, large, uh, monorail camera. Not quite the same one as mine. I think it's a little bit nicer than mine. Um, but I really liked it uh, in a way that I, I find that the Sinar is is it's just it's excellent. It's very well made and so on and so on. Um, but there's something about the, the, the Toyo that I particularly like. And I think one of the things I like about it is it's got geared rise and fall. I like gears and I like geared rise and fall in particular. So I've got that with my Meridian on the on the front mm. element as well. Well, you could upgrade your Sinar probably for less than you. I don't know how much you paid, but you could, I upgrade when I had a Sinar started off. It started off as an F1 and then it ended up as a P something or other with the metal geared front and rear standards and to be honest it was so bloody complicated and i thought i just sold it all and bought a toyo toyo 45a field camera which is excellent yeah well 
okay so that's that's one thing and yes i could upgrade it but the other thing that this that the, the toyo has that i really really like uh it's got axis tilt on both standards mm-hmm. whereas the the sign i use is base tilt yeah and you know base tilt's okay there's nothing wrong with base tilt but axis tilt is better isn't it maybe well, you, if you if you're adjusting your your rear standard or your front standard for that matter, and you mm-hmm. and you're actually changing that your uh, your plane of focus, yeah. if you're using base tilt, then you're also moving the. Uh, yeah. you move I know, the- but in reality, it doesn't take long to adjust for that, Simon. If you've got as long as you've got a beer mat and you have a <laughs> fine understanding of the Scheimflug principle, you're fine. Yes. I'm talking that's such a load of bollocks here this morning. <laughs> Sam, um, do you have a good understanding of the Scheinflug principle? Was that a question for me? Yeah, Sam, I, do you have I, a good I, understanding I, of the Scheinflug principle? It's a, I, I know what it is. I, I've seen the Ansel Adams description of it in his book. I never, yeah. I don't use movements because I'm, I'm, uh, my approach to photography involves a kind of verisimilitude that you, that you don't get with the distortions of the movements. Silence. Well, that's the first time we've had the word very. Yeah, I, I can't I'm, even I'm, very simil- I can't even say it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, for the benefit of all our, our listeners, Andrew, would you just explain what Sam just said to us? No, <laughs> carry on. I interrupted you rudely in in full flow. What else have you been up to? <laughs> you were talking about. Oh, shine flu. Yeah, no, I'll explain that another time. You have to go back to an earlier episode to understand how to manipulate. Um, uh, Greg, I think, explained it, or Wayne, one of those two. Uh, well, I get the muddled up, explained well, it really well. Well, certainly, yeah. Wayne. Wayne did... saying, you're talking about your 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 sinar. I have a Norma, and yeah. the 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 good rail cameras are better with movements. And I find you, if you're going to use movements, you really need a good good ground glass system. And there's only a few camera makers, Linhoff and Sinar, uh, that have ground glasses that are good enough to actually see of course i can't see a thing but um that, that you have to be able to look in the corners and make sure everything's mm. just as you want it and spend the time bent over so I, i'd rather just I'm, I'm more of a my style of large format photography happens to be more of a street photography well interesting i will i will have the opportunity to put the two side by side and just 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 play with them and uh, swap the swap the lens the, use the same lens perhaps and just swap it swap it between the two and uh, just see which one's actually easier to use in in, in reality um, i bet the toyo is a pretty good camera yeah. do you know they were the ones who bought, who acquired the um, all of this um, the graphlex of uh, machinery from singer so the toyo cameras would be the kind of modern day manifestation of the press camera and whatever else they, they're doing in, in large format. And I believe they're still making cameras. They are still making, yeah. I mean, my 45A, uh, I think they still make a version of that. Uh, they might not, uh, whether it's called the A2 or they call it something else now, but it's very, very similar. But they are still making them, yeah. Yeah, good. It's good. Well, just to just to go go back to clarify the uh, when we did talk about the shine flug in in well we've talked about it many times but the oh. the the famous episode was the one with Wayne Wayne Sepp, it was so, Wayne was it yeah, yeah he, he yeah. is he is the beer mat stroke coaster for Americans um, uh, uh, person that came up with the uh, the definitive way to uh, explain uh, the shine flug principle so that yeah. was on episode eight um, really was it. The shine flug is, is a section in a, in a good workshop, and it probably takes up more time than half the people are interested in, in, in taking. But some, if you're going to learn large format photography, it's 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 useful and critical, and it's it's part of the tradition, and it's a real it's a real tool. Along with wide brimmed hats, hats of course, good shoes. I think is is the main mm-hmm. thing. Shoes. Now we've not really talked about large format photographer shoes before, so do you want to elaborate on that one? Well, I'll have my time after you. Well, funnily enough, my time is now over uh, because that's pretty much all I've been up for. Actually, I have been up to something else that's been quite exciting, but I can't talk about that just yet. So, uh, so I know. Oh well, there you go. Um, so that's pretty much it for for what I've been up to, or some of it at least for the last few weeks. So, Sam, what have, what have you? What's been occupying you lately? I, I'm here at Famous Format in Ashland, in the court, in where we started the New Fifty Five project. 
Bob Crowley is renting me space upstairs and I'm making film and without Charles Fenrock making pods and uh, putting at, putting in the hours with me, I wouldn't be able to keep this um, positive negative material going, going out. And I've, I've more or less hit a stride this year where I can, uh, I could build so many boxes a month and I'm trying to, to, um, pace it so that I can make just enough money to keep us, to get us to this, this event that I can't actually talk about, which is a financing event, which is in sometime in the future, hopefully second quarter this year, but it would, it would be a way of reorganizing the assets of new 55. So into a corporation so that we and get investment. In. And uh, the way I'm approaching it is to try to use the new resources in equity crowdfunding that are available so that any with a been and use establish a very low minimum so that even starving artists and large format photographers could, could buy our, our stock, but I'm not permitted according to sec rules to talk about it. You're just teasing us for the moment. So that's all about, I can say, but I, I, my, the dream lives. It is, been my intention to keep this alive since we lost our pod vendor back in the end of 27, mid 2017. And that was a real shocker. And that really drove Bob uh, Crowley away from supporting the thing. Well, it, um, I don't know if it, it would seem a, a reasonable time then to perhaps um, talk about that in a, in a bit more uh, detail, but we, you've just, as is the way we do these things now, you've been uh, joining in in our pre-ramble, amble, ramble. Um, so should we formally introduce you and then you can tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, yourself, your photographic love and how you got into New 55. Should we do that? Please do, Andrew. Yeah. Well, we're, is that okay, Simon? Should I go I, and introduce Sam? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So we're very pleased to be joined on episode 24 by Sam Heiser. And Sam is someone I've been uh, on my radar for a long, long time. And we've, I'm sure we've exchanged emails on, particularly in the early days of New 55, or maybe it was Bob. I don't know. It was one of those two guys. Uh, but I was a New 55 backer and uh, been a massive Polaroid fan for the last 10 years or so. Unfortunately, I was never really a Polaroid fan when it was available. Uh, when this Kickstarter was announced for New 55, I was really excited. So, Sam, lovely to have you here. Why don't you just give us a bit of background about yourself and uh, how you got into New 55, start telling the story, highs and lows, and uh, me and Simon can ask questions as we go along because I'm sure a lot will come out of what you have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. A roller coaster ride. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> um, uh, where to begin? I, I'm a business person and an amateur photographer and got terribly ill in the, in the early, well, I'd been, had Lyme disease most of my life. Didn't realize it until my daughter got sick. And oh, that's an getting, awful thing. It was getting, yeah, it's in England. It's everywhere. Yeah. Our story ends well. Uh, thanks to my wife, who's genius. Um, but I was in the sloth of despond of the recovery process, which is two years of antibiotics, which is the most painful mm. thing ever. And I was trying to figure out how to use the two good days available to me. And I said, ah, I know what. I'll go back into the dark room. This is 2009. And um, found a, I was on Martha's Vineyard, and there was a wonderful art center there called Featherstone Center for the Arts. And there was a RISD. A uh, woman who used to be a photographer at the Boston Globe, you know, garden section or something. Wonderful person, Kathy Rose, and she was running courses in the dark room. And basically, the dark room by 2009 had fallen out of use. And so I said, to Kat, "Call Kathy." I said, "Kathy, I need, I need, I need a weekly session in the dark room." And so she brought, she not only brought me up to speed with Henry Hornstein's book, the, the 101 of dark room method. Uh, she recommended a few books. The Ansel Adams trilogy came in there, and you showed me Ansel Adams' autobiography today. That was on the list. Uh, Arno Minkinen, a couple books were laying about in dust in this old dark room. And we, Kathy and I together pulled all the pieces together and retaped 
the light leaks and brought the Featherstone darkroom back. And I, after a year or so, started teaching little kids a Holga class there. So I sort of fell deeply into photography in 2009 through, through, through 11. And in that period was 2010 was when Bob Crowley up here in Ashland, Massachusetts was, was running the experiments on DTR, which is the Polaroid positive negative transfer process, diffusion transfer reversal. And Polaroid's second bankruptcy had taken place in 2008. So Crowley was doing that and he was, um, as an, a real inventor, not just a tinkerer, Bob is a legit science person, but he's also literate in a, as an artist, interesting guy and uh, background there. But, um, he was having some success with his, with rediscovering the diffusion transfer reversal process that Edwin Land had, had incorporated, which Edwin Land had found. Edwin Land had not invented DTR. He had, he had lifted it from the Germans after the war. Um, and, and, and what Bob had discovered was that Land never actually kind of fudged where, where that transfer process was. And the Polaroids, Polaroid people internally have since remarked to me that, oh, the transfer wasn't the big thing. It was the pod. And then we're talking about 1948 to 1953 or 55 when the first Polaroid cameras and film came out. But in any case, in 2010, Bob Crowley was, was starting a blog. He was asking around in the Boston area where the old Polaroid retired, not old, some of them were quite old, but retired, bitter, bitterly retired Polaroid employees were still living and still are. And they weren't that interested in supporting something like what, what Bob was asking about the tech techniques and technology. And, and Bob had done his own patent search. So he had found out that there were no patents to, to, to fear treading on. And what we had in four by five was this this latent supply of these five forty five holders that had become doorstops since the bankruptcy because none of this peel apart film. So the five forty five holders, Sam, they're the devices that you need if you want to shoot this posneg material. Yeah, that's right. New fifty five PN is the product. Now there's two speeds: PN one hundred and PN PN four hundred, yep. and you have to get a five forty five holder or a five forty five I. I. They're the lighter ones, aren't they? Yes, the, the more recent vintage. And we have preferences, but we sell both. And we yeah. had to, to, to get this Kickstarter underway in 2014, I had to, you know, we had 2,500 supporters among uh, um, yourself included. Yeah. And we had to make sure that the, the users were getting good enough quality holders. You can buy them on eBay for 10 bucks, but they're probably, they've got problems with their, they're, they're fairly complex mechanisms and there's springs in them and they're, they're they were built some of them in 1970 early 70s uh, anyway, so, i took you down a, a, a different path there you i think you were still um back in 2009 yeah you know? Crowley, and he had done something I, I i perceived was pretty shrewd he um he was kind of open sourcing the conversation about rediscovering this material and what bob had discovered was that by 2010 what you did with a four by five negative was you scanned it on an Epson V 700 or 750 or whatever it was, which was a three, $400 flatbed scanner. And the, uh, the accutance of a, of a four by five negative in a scanning situation is unreal because we've still, we were at the time we were starting to get used to digital photography and the, what the optical system of a four by five camera, was such that uh, with with a negative as large as your fist, you you get these 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 tonal transitions and tonalities and and, and sharpnesses and and the change of sharpness into from sharp to blurry that are quite astonishing. And so, uh, when young people who've never had the old uh, manual optical systems encounter this kind of thing, they're pretty shocked and it's pretty exciting. Just the same way, uh, you know, making a print in a darkroom is exciting to a 10-year-old kid. Like the way the image comes up on the paper in the fluid, it's, it's just like, wow, wow. And you sort of fall into it right there. Crowley was sharing some of his experiments and transfer, but also some of his images. 
and uh, a chap from Scotland, uh, Tobias Feltis, was 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 doing some of the experimenting along along the way. And Tobias is an interesting artist in his own right and a very very interesting fellow. I think I've got a T-shirt with his picture on it. I'm sure yeah, I have. Right. And Tobias is very helpful <laughs> getting us all through the Kickstarter. So there's a UK connection there, but Tobias is in Arizona, I believe now with his wife, but um, nevertheless, uh, still, I believe a, le- a legit artist. I, I always would be eager to know what Tobias is, is going to bring out, but ne- nevertheless, Bob was Bob's, Bob's activity was credible. And I, like you had missed Polaroid, you know, I, mm-hmm. I sort of fell into photography in 2009 and regretted. And what was happening with me was I, I was doing a barn series in this, in this new England vernacular place with lots of old shingle buildings and i found very quickly with a handheld camera that the sides of the buildings didn't line up so i said damn i have to get a press camera so i can move the front rise i I said i didn't like movements but front rise is the one i use and that's to make the line straight and that was how i sort of drifted into sheet film for that one requirement, right? I had a technical purpose that I, that I needed to satisfy. So I got, I, I, I had a very, I somehow have to write this up or I've written it somewhere where I, at uh, E.P. Levine's, I stumbled into E.P. Levine's, the Photoshop in, in Boston, which at that time was, uh, was on the, on the Harbor. It was on the, in, in, in South Boston. And, uh, there were some great photographers there. Cole Bellamy was his name. He sold me a, uh, a Graflex camera and the circumstances of that are fairly amusing, but this thing was in an old, old fiber case that looked like it had been pulled out of a, out of a fireman's funeral and um, probably dated 1963 or four camera with lenses. And I used that and I, that I, I was using that in the dark room in the vineyard and doing my landscape stuff and trees and such things. And so, but um, what happened was Bob Crowley, I, I sort of commented on on the blog and said, this is interesting. And we became friends. We ended up calling and it, it became apparent to me that he was the real deal and he wasn't just tinkering. And also his background, he, he had a real invent, invention. He had a couple invention wins. One was an intravascular ultrasound with Boston Scientific. And he had a real exit from that. And um, money, but it was a it's 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 a it's a piece of technology that it, it involves with the placement of stents and it's a, it's mm-hmm. a medical miracle so uh bob bob previous to our my meeting him had also invented a certain type of ribbon microphone and i'm i'm a drummer and i care about microphones overhead and ribbons are good microphones for drums because they're good vocal mics but what people don't realize often is that you need good mid range and a microphone to catch a drum and make a drum sound like it's a real, it's really there in the space. It has, it has all these different tones on, but Bob had invented a ribbon microphone. He he even invented a type of material that had a mass and strength characteristics that he called the materials called Roswellite. (laughs) Interesting. And as long story short, he sold that business to sure the microphone company. And that was a successful exit there. So I understood what Bob was capable of. And he was interested in frequencies. He was, he's interested in nano materials and his background is deep and wide and real. And he was experimenting with this film. And I said, Bob, what do you think the market of a four by five positive negative peel part is? And we sort of, he had some ideas about that. I said, what, what would the price be? And so we, we kind of did, went back and forth. And then I came to visit him, as we do, at the uh, Soundwave uh, Laboratory in Ashland. And we had lunch and we had a nice time. And we had portraits and we, tr- we tested Triax as the negative and the positive negative. And it actually worked pretty well that day. Um, so... I, I was traveling up there f- more frequently or we were exchanging things like spreadsheets and I was trying to project what the, you know, what a certain, I was doing some, some financial projections as to what the viability of different market market quantities would be. And that was sort of my background. I had started in investment banking. I have an MBA. I, my, my undergraduate degree is English literature and art history. So I'm interested in art. I 
always have been, and I always kind of involved in, in photography. But business and art, it's, it's hard. It's it's hard for them to go together, and I've always wanted to figure out a way to do that. And if I have any regrets right now, I don't take enough pictures. I, uh, the, the testing we do is I'm taking portraits of Charles and he's taking portraits of me and that's a little lemonade, but we've gotten some good portraits. But in any case, Crowley, we got talking long enough and people were saying, Kickstarter, Kickstarter, you got to Kickstarter this. And the interest, as you guys will attest, in Polaroid is very, very strong still. And, you know, Pack Film has gone away. Fuji has discontinued Pack Film in 2015 or something like that. And Pack Film is a whole class of instant photography of its own with its own dedicated style of camera. There's so many of those cameras around it that there's a lot of people that are willing to support in, in the, re the revival of instant photography. And of course, I'm talking about me and Bob meeting in 2012, 13 ish. And that was, I forget what year, Doc Caps saved the factory at polaroid well it was it was shortly after wasn't it It was around about that same time I think it was uh, it was 2012 oh, i've lost track of it now i think yeah because i think i think i was i bought my first very early it wasn't quite the first flush but i did shoot some first flush and i was a pioneer with impossible yeah, it would so, have been 11 12 that sort of time so was bob having conversations with um uh, Doc and well, Doc those was guys. He's a friend, and um, yes, and I think at some point there was a there was a conference call. But what, what was what was what was in our minds, and I I think I speak for Bob on this. He we had seen Doc use Kickstarter to round up the money to get the factory together. Yeah, so it was a validating experience that had already taken place that validated both the interest right andrew you're a walking testament to the to the energy and excitement and interest in instant film so mm -hmm. so you are you and the thousands of others who are willing to support these kickstarters to bring back this instant film this is a real thing and it was sort of news to me come 2013 14 but in any case some friends of mine that were credible said sam you really no, you really should kickstart this thing so bob was kind of like well, we have to kind of get this all underway. And look, if we have a Kickstarter, it's good either way. If it, if we, if we don't make the, if, we, if we're honest about what it's going to cost and how much money we need, and are transparent about the approach, and inform these youngsters what what manufacturing something takes, you know, what does it take? What does it cost? Any kind of corporate project begins at a million or two or five million dollars. So we figured out we could live with four hundred. I think three hundred and fifty thousand dollars was the, was the first thing, and we thought that was a lot of money in the context of this thing. Um, we came to a, a conclusion that four hundred thousand dollars was the, was the minimum needed, and so Bob said, "Sam, you come up and do this and run this Kickstarter." And Bob did this sort of pr promote the, the key video and he did a good, good, good video for it. And he took, he put his, his, he stood up and put his name on it and said, we're doing this and we'll come, come join us. And I did all the PR stuff in the background and I built a bunch of websites to get all the old type 55 uh, examples that we could find from David Bennett, from Sarah Moon, from hmm. David. Bailey from a whole list of real legit photographers who loved type 55 and Ansel Adams. Ansel, we, we use, actually the Boston globe showed that wonderful Yosemite picture, uh, more, uh, the winter morning, which, yeah. which is actually a print that I've seen in the Met in New York. And it's like a, a 30 inch print. And that was such a Testament. And it's almost falls on deaf ears for the youngsters now who scan things, but in a type 55 negative for Ansel Adams was kind of a very, it was the Holy grail because you could print, you could enlarge that quite big. You could even contact print it for books, but it was a very good, um, source, uh, material, 
having been exposed and developed, it was a very good source for a print, a four by five negative. And Ansel, what we learned later, you know, why was the, the original Polaroid Type 55 material, the print and the negative were two stops apart in terms of the densities. So you had to favor the print in the, through, in the exposure if you cared about the print more. But it really, it was a negative, wasn't it? What they should have been aiming at. Well, I should. People love the print, but yeah. the, the system was designed by Ansel and Edwin, Edwin Land together uh, in between their bar sessions. And the uh, Ansel wanted the negative. I love the negative. I, you know, I'm interested as a photographer in this negative. The print for me is nothing more than a, a, a verification as I'm peeling it that something happened. Some of them are, are, are wonderful and beautiful, but there's a whole host of photographers that we, we – our print is not that great yet, even today, uh, because we haven't done the research to keep improving it. But the goal ultimately would be to, to give a black and white print that's like a Fuji print uh, with really good D min, D max. But in any case, for me, the print is adequate because I'm really shooting for the negative. Uh, but there's like a whole list of people and I can name them. Catherine just loves the print. You know, there's, there's uh, Bridget Niedermeyer. So there, there's a, uh, right now on our Instagram feed, uh, Kyle Gost, uh, um, Gostinger has just done some really nice figural work with, and, and he's put up the print. So sometimes you just never see the negatives. Catherine herself who's more of a conceptual artist. She throws away the negative, but Ansel kept the negative and, and, and cleared it in the day. You clear it in sodium sulfite. And that and was... And you still have to do that now, don't you, using Ilford's... We, um, we, use, fixer, we use Fixer to clear it, yep. and it does actually does fix it a bit. And, and you have to get it right in the Fixer without exposing it to light, unless you're deliberately trying to solarize the negative. Hmm. But in any case, one of the things that Crowley's science and experimentation and development on this Kickstarter project achieved was that the, the, the new 55 PN positive and negative come out at even density when you shoot it at box speed. And this is true for both speeds. Now the PN 100 and the PN 400. Now is the print adequate for your purposes? Quite, if you're a print type person, probably quite possibly not. And it's not a good enough print for people, the youngsters, well, or people uh, who are really interested in pack film are yeah. looking for, like a Fuji peel apart print. Well, that was, yeah, I, I, we're kind of a bit out of step now in the history, but actually it's a really key point, I think, Sam, and I'd be interested to hear your views on it. And, but, and I think when you're marketing this material and, you know, you, it's it's on sale now, I'm staring at the famous uh, large and small format Photography Co. website. Um, but if, if people have been used to shooting pack film, uh, with the exception of, say, uh, you know, where you could re you could reclaim the negative on Fuji material, but on some of the on some of those materials, but mainly people were after the print. So suddenly, and they might have been shooting Fuji four by five instant film. Where, again, it was all about the print. And w when I first shot this, I was quite frankly disappointed that I wasn't getting that um, uh, lovely print. And, and then I started researching and said well actually it's actually not about the print and it's a whole shift in uh, in how you how you how you um how you think about this process isn't it because I, I i had to and you could expose to get a good print but then the negative was a bit on the thin side well you can uh, even though it, it, our system if you shoot it at box speed the densities are even but you can still have your preference for how dense you want your print and if you care yeah. about the print you can find that place, and I, I still have been putting this off because I'm basically not marketing at all. All I do is send messages to the list when I need some more sales. And, uh, and we have Facebook and Instagram to show people people what they're doing, but there's zero marketing because we have to maintain. I, I don't want to. We the, the the reason is that Soundwave owns the assets and the intellectual property, and in I've I've promise to respect Bob's needs that while he still owns all the stuff that he funded through throughout the Kickstarter phase and the R and D phase, um, we have, Bob and I have a have negotiated a price for the assets and intellectual property. So once that, that reorganization and the funding takes place and the assets move into the new entity, then we blow the doors off 
and we reinvent we start investing in the research to make the print right and also the research and knowledge we have to we have to reaccumulate knowledge on how to make color print and color negative and color reagent material well it, yeah i mean you did a you 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 did launch into a bit of color um well, we, positive well, negative we were, stuff didn't you well the color was uh, was uh, offered and sold to us by 20 by 24 studios and they still have a lot of color material but this is not a viable you know, if we're reorganizing a corporation, we need to have in-house knowledge and we need to manufacture our source materials, full stop, yeah. right? So the goal of, of the reorganization, if you will, of, of new, w w under this new company, which I've created with Charles, New 55 Film Inc., um, it's the, 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 the whole reason for doing that is to do the black and white peel apart, refine that until it, you get a Fuji-like print, or at least there's maybe a fixerless peel apart where you can discard the negative and you get a great print in black and white. But you have to have color. And we, and we can't, you know, in the interim, perhaps we can supply ourselves with existing color materials that we can buy. But the supply lines are, are not secure because vendors, vendors have their own interests mm. and their own limitations and their own competitive um back well you've got doc doing his pack film haven't you one instant well, he's, actually, he's using the old um, polaroid well, film well, stock isn't he still yeah the pack film doc is doing one instant to which we were you know we've supported that coming out of vienna is on the same material it's the p3 that john ruder and ted mcclellan and nafiz Assad had a 20 has still a 20 by 24 or it could be the p7 i i forget p7 which. i think i saw a reference so, to p7 so material John and the that team 20 by 24 who have um their facility is right in our same building in the warehouse end of our building okay um they were supplying our pods and we fell out with them and that was this that was the problem and People need to remember, and that stopped us cold. That was a real yeah. Well, well why don't you go back? Because I'm I'm sorry, I've led you as other th as you've said things. It's prompted other questions, but actually, in the timeline of thing, you had your your Kickstarter was successful, wasn't it? Do you want to pick up the story yeah. there? What happened yeah. after it was so it got over the line? Bob, yeah, Bob said Sam run the Kickstarter. I did that. It worked, and it worked because of these 2,500 people willing to like yourself. And unlike yourself, but 2,500 individuals put in 400 and some thousand dollars, and we met, we met the goal. And it was an all or nothing yeah. sort of situation. And Bob comes back from his vacation and he goes, "Drat!" <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think we were going to do it. <laughs> so, so um, we were committed to fulfilling 5,000 boxes, 25,000 exposures of the material and we had a pretty good idea there we had already a pretty good idea of, of of how it was going to go but like we advertised in the kickstarter pitch you know people please don't invest in this this is a risky thing this can go wrong this way and this way and this thing can happen and you and it, as it turned out we had the roof caved in and the snow and water and all kinds of mishaps. We lost about a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars on a vendor. We tried to coat a, sh a shipload of material that didn't work. And Charles Fenrock and Jen and Mick saved the day by going into the back shed and hand coating all these five, 25,000 sheets with a Meyer rod. You had this plywood hand and that was the device that, for coating that, didn't it? that is still in use charles and i still use that, that <laughs> thing bob calls it the thing the, and it, the uh, thing yeah that's it it's got some elegance to it uh but that's that's how we coat the, the print now yeah um you know funded and reorganized this company will have a second thing for redundancy it will be uh, the thing now is five inches wide 300 foot long paper rolled up it produces uh a th I, I think i think one run which takes a morning produces a thousand pieces if our target threshold of of production is five thousand pieces a month uh we're going to need to run that on five days a month which is possible uh the next version of that machine would be a 10 uh, a 10 inch wide which would produce twice as much in the same effort 
and open up the possibility to eight inch wide material. Mm. So it is my goal in this. I want to get, I'll I'll get back to the history. I promise Andrew, but but (laughs) my goal with reorganizing this thing as an entity to protect the assets and grow and scale a manufacturing business would be to have four by five positive, negative four by five color peel apart print at least five by seven positive negative and wow. peel aparts and eight by 10 positive negative black and white positive negative, and color so so it's a large format entity and so i do spend a lot of time thinking about what is large format photography like you do and uh simon as well you too I think about what that what it is today, what it is historically, and what it is and what it could be. And I think that what we're experiencing now in the post, what Bob Crowley called the post digital era, is is a real revival of interest in manual photography, which is what large format photography is. And I think having a peel apart instant material that's more or less instant doesn't really need a darkroom, although the fixer process is kind of cumbersome especially in the landscape, right? Yeah. If, if large format photography has a peel apart instant material, especially one that has a negative, right? Or in, in all those formats, you're really doing something to make large format photography more accessible because dark rooms, in fact, are going away. They, they're in the education space. You have your community dark rooms. They're not going to go away forever completely. But it's not, it's not going to be, they're not going to be easily accessible for beginners. So to have a material that this, that, that this, 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 this ed, it, it's an educational material. It's, it's a way of, you know, the reveal of the photograph is not instantaneous, but it's, it's, it's less inconvenient, right? So what we found was at the time there was already a resurgence. The, the, the photography and the maker movement were already crossing, crossing over as digital photography was maturing in 2009, 2010, right? So uh, um, if, you, if you looked up at the time we did our Kickstarter in 2014, there were already you know, more than a half a dozen new camera makers popping up around the world. You've got Max Grew, what he's doing with Intrepid, right? Mm -hmm. You've got um, VDS in Hungary. You've got Balm in Italy. You've got Stenopeka. You already had Chamonix, which is excellent. Um, They're all creditable. Uh, You still have Sinar, I believe. You still have the Japanese makers. Nagaoka in Japan has not stopped. Sinar, Linhoff. Um, in America, you have uh, KB Canham, and 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 Keith Canham is still making very very fine large format cameras. And the Bellows manufacturer is, I think, in the UK, <laughs> and he does it for all. So there was already a resurgence of of interest in manual photography, come digital, and I think our motivations for getting involved in instant large format film. Um, are, are really cultural. They're not historic. We're not Polaroid pol- polophiles. Um, we love and respect Polaroid and are, are, and are inspired by that. Uh, and Polaroid Originals getting, getting its organization and, f- and funding and, and, or, and, and the branding of that is very exciting and, and deserved. Um, the absence of peel apart of the pack film variety, personally, I, I don't care. Um, but it'd be nice if somebody could, could do that and satisfy all those exciting, you know, that, that format is very, actually, it, it has a social use. It's very important. Yeah. And yeah. it would. I was, going, I, was going, I was going to say, Sam, um, well, I'll also add uh, Steve Lloyd and Chroma camera to that long list of uh, recent and new uh, camera manufacturers. Oh, yeah. So, and, and Walker is in there, probably yeah. predated our Kickstarter. So, I mean, it's pretty astonishing, right? Do you think this, this environment where sheet film sales are growing double digits annually, we think, 
um, and new new suppliers are, are, are available and uh, Mako Direct is, is great and Photo Impex um, is doing great and Foma Factory is still around and maybe even Ferrania will come on. Um, yep. It's very positive, right? And um, there is a real reason for manual photography to exist, particularly sheet film photography in the large format spaces. And, and, and it's a cultural thing. And it's about, to me, the future of photography. It's not about the past, although the past is very interesting and, and exciting. Uh, we are not antiquarians, even though I, 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 I really thrive on conversations and learning about alternative process printing processes but you see a four by five negative that's really cool and really good has application for gel silver printing in the dark room that's one that's still a good way to print a photograph right you can scan it and just keep it in your digital domain for social media purposes you can scan it and make a good really good inkjet print with it you can do any way, any method of a dozen alternative processes from cyanotype to platinum palladium to, to photogravure with this four by five negative. And to me, that's just the balls. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that to me, I'm, I've got a purpose. Okay. So that's, that's why I'm, it's taken us more than two years to, to sort of reorganize this thing. And to me, it's worth it. It's really worth it. And Charles, I can speak for Charles. He agrees and Charles is there with me, and we're going to pull this thing together. And but we're not going to do it alone, and we're going to need the kind of support uh, times ten that we had in the Kickstarter. And we're going to structure it in a way so that everyone can participate. And one of the things that happened that first year, 2018, was I put a 60-page business plan together and got some real good feedback from some pretty good. You know, Boston is a VC place, venture capital. I had a couple of people read the thing and they, they told me. And so, so here, here's what's the, 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 the top line of the business plan is uh, make and sell company, early stage company, manufacturer based in New England, um, instant film photography product that is unique. No one else knows how to do this. So we are, we are sort of a niche monopoly of a instant film that's in the, the, the large format niche within the larger world of photography now that's interesting because nobody else does this and we have trade secrets to do this and we have proven that the market or at least the excitement exists we don't know what the size of the market is but we believe that if you do certain certain numbers a company like this five to seven years out could be 20 million dollars in annual revenue just on a black and white peel apart positive negative now if you add color you double that and that's $20 $20 million isn't the kind of size of a business that any of the VC care about at all. And to, 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 to put investment in, you know, you're, you're, I'm raising a million dollars now for some share of the company and a million dollars. They, they've got $10 million to put into uh, one situation. They don't have one or fifty thousand dollars. That so so. What's what the feedback from the VC and the angel community? Uh, the few that I spoke to was first of all, it's too small. It's you know we wish you luck. Manufacturing, go Sam. And this is a specialty niche where you you have a real barrier uh, to entry. Um, but but the VC are looking for. AI, blockchain, robotics, and the next Facebook. And the angels have been spoiled by the last three things they invested in. So they're looking for billion-dollar companies. Mm -hmm. So I said, this is going to be a tough – I said, Sam, this is going to be a uh, a tough deck to present at the venture capital conference. To these people that, you know, they have more zeros than I can fit in my garage. <laughs> so um, the next day, uh, so I was like tearing the 60 page business plan up long wise, like a phone book. I couldn't, I couldn't even tear it up. The next day I get a call from the CEO of Start Engine 
which is one of the equity crowdfunding platforms. And that's all I'm going to say. And I said, I said, Charles, I think, I think this is the way to go because all of our excited Pola files and, and instant film lovers and all the great people, we have a, we have a mailing list that's almost 20,000 large segmented all different ways from our experience since 2014. So, so we can do this. Um, and it's, as, 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 as getting, getting organized and getting it getting it in a position to do it the right way yeah i was going to say yeah i'm just going back to what you're saying earlier this is i think it's a truly exciting time uh to be involved in photography and large format photography and analog photography in in in, in general at the moment and um I think I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just ever so slightly concerned. You probably might be saying more than you perhaps you should have been saying because you said you weren't going to talk about it. So I'll, I'll, I'll gonna take take the direction um, some somewhere slightly back back to your product again, if if I may, and um, because I'm. I'm, I'm not a Polaroid shooter. I didn't, I hadn't used to shoot Polaroid and it's, it's, you know, generally speaking, it's, it's not my thing, but I'm, I'm really interested in the process and what actually goes on with, with this and the, in the products. And I'm, I'm looking at your, your site at the moment and you've got uh, new 55, um, and you've also got something on there called one shot and you're also sell, selling atomic X film. Mm. And would I be correct in think, because this one shot's, because you said you mentioned earlier about using triax in, in your early days and uh, and so on um in this one shot is the, it mentions that uh, there are different types of film that could be used with it um is is your product actually more the, the the pod and the chemicals and the way that that works and then you you get well in, i assume the atomic x film is is your own branded film uh, but you you're able to use different films in your one shot and it does it use the same chemicals in each one or is it um, one, one shot is not instant film it's just like the old ready load so it's a pa it's, it's using our our uh, the holder 5 the 545 holder and our film packet system the tongue assembly and the sleeve and we're putting an off the shelf sheet film in there so you could you could do one shot triax or one shot t max or one shot ilford HP five plus or pro portrait. We like the color people love portrait. I love portrait. So Sam, when I, so to, to answer a bit of Simon's question, Simon, I, I don't know where the new 55 eventually settled on atomic X. And I think there's a story behind atomic X, um, which you can see for sale on the website. So oh, the new, the instant PN stuff is PM 100 is still atomic X. I think isn't, isn't it? Well, it, can, it can vary. And can it's, it? Of issue, but Atomic X was this kind of a special film we sourced, and the cost was right, and we had some influence on the emulsion. And what happens is, if we don't control what the emulsion is, they're prone to change. Some of the ingredients, like the sensitizer, even Kodak might might one month change something. And if we don't have control over what's in it, this, the thing can start working differently. It starts behaving differently for reasons we can't tell, and then we have to identify the you know, the, the job number, job lot number. And then if we have a conversation with the factory, which we don't in all cases, we have to find out what, the, what, what happened because the prints aren't coming out. So um, there is a, it is, is a supply chain question, right? It's a classic supply chain control issue. So there was a long, the, the Kickstarter period, at least the Kickstarter fulfillment period, it was all Atomic X that was in the PN product. Yeah. But we could use, and we could adapt the reagent to an off the shelf black and white positive negative. And we would do so, so long as we had some confidence that uh, it wasn't gonna change spontaneously. And, you know, we'll have shipped 10 boxes with something that, uh, that, that works as poorly. But but at the moment it's if I buy a box or anyone else buys PN one hundred it is Atomic X in there. PN four hundred is is an off the shelf negative that we um, we got the reagent to work with and it, right. it works a little differently than the print is a little different in character from the one PN one hundred but because of the nature of reagent oozing through uh, these two substrates with the negative facing the paper, the nature of that development gives you this, this crushingly beautiful negative and it's, it, it works regardless what the transfer or the, 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 
the, the paper experience is because the, re, the, the the reagent contains the developer, and the paper takes away the unused silver. So if if you're you know if you if you're a competitor wondering how we do our thing, the the two things that we guard uh, <clears throat> with some energy are <clears throat> there's the reagent and how the pod is made and how the reagent gets in the pod. And then there's the coating on the paper that is the receiver sheet. And then um, the negative, uh, if we were to have an influence on what the emulsion um, composition should be, then that would be um, a proprietary trade secret too. But that's basically what Polaroid was doing. And we, we found, we figured it out and we hacked it. And um, I must say that Doc Caps, that activity with Polaroid was influential in, in our confidence in trying to kickstart the thing and, and, and making something available out of what Bob Crowley had discovered. Um, I also must say that the project wouldn't have gotten into the Kickstarter with any confidence had not John Reuter and Ted McClellan and Nafiz Assad uh, been a, been handy and been available to offer um, a turnkey solution of the pod for sale. So so those guys at 2024 provided the pod. That was the solution, and they were making pods on a Polaroid machine. So those were essentially Polaroid pods. And when they quit, or you know, they had their own reasons, um, and. Is that when is that when U fifty five effectively for us out in you know sit, sitting in front of our computers and saying it's going to be no more you know for, uh, yeah. there was a time wasn't there a few years ago when it was actually it's yeah. dead that was that was the end of twenty seventeen and that was because we had new fifty new fifty five holdings LLC was an entity Bob and I were the you know the principals of that and Bob insisted that that we have to shut down we have to yeah. end it's it's over. And, and there was almost no discussing that. Um, but I spent January after that. I said, I said, I said, what, what do we have here? And Charles and I, I remember sitting across the table saying, Charles, we've learned a lot. Um, do you, do you really want to leave, leave this go? And so over the course of the next couple months, um, I worked out a way in which, um, we could, um, price, for the assets and intellectual property. I don't use the new 55 film brand. You don't see that around. I created famous format, for example, as a place to do this while we figured out what to do. The answer wasn't quite clear and I'll send you a link, but there was a time in September of 2018 after I had met Jason Lane, Jason had helped me puzzle out how we were going to do, you know, approach the pod manufacturing ourselves, Charles and I. And we actually, we solved it and it wasn't without Jason's ideas and they were wrong, but they put us on a path to, to, to sourcing a, 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 an avenue, a way to approach it. So there was, there is, you know, the old new 55 website still says has closed operations, but famous format is where you, is, is, is the shingle where you go to get the stuff and I'm selling it so that, you know, I can, I can keep this thing going and we can continue to figure out to get it to the starting line in a reorganized place. So this is, this has been from January, 2018 through till now, which is two and a half years or will be. Yeah. Um, so that's why people are puzzled. I haven't been able to communicate full voiced because sound wave research lab still on. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of folks out there, I know just from on social media um, will say, well, I it doesn't exist anymore. New 55 died. And I think, you know, the, the, the message is it hopefully will get out there a little bit from the podcast. I mean, we're not going to be reaching everybody, but um, you know, it seems to be alive and well, and you have a proper vision, it's, a proper it's vision for the future. Bad. Yeah. It's, it's a technicality to say that it's alive. The, <laughs> right. There is, there is no entity. Um, the, the only important entity is Soundwave Research Labs and the assets that, uh, under, you know, Bob Crowley's good graces, he's, yeah. he's just this window, but you've got a plan for, yeah, which you're not, which you're not talking about. 
Well, I'm really happy about the plan because, you know, here, here are the, the whole story since the beginning for me of the Kickstarter in 2014 has been, well, this stuff is $15 a shot. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, our response to that was, well, that's the best we can do because, you know, we're making it by hand. And um, uh, there is a natural price for this material under a scaled manufacturing condition, right? And it's not $15 a pop. It's, on, it's, it's got to be below 10 But there's a point when you, you know, scaling a manufacturing business is something Americans used to know how to do. And we're going to relearn how to do it, you know? And well, I think if you can get it below ten dollars a sheet, then you're um, you're you'll you'll be on a winner, I'm sure. We asked Adam Goldberg, one of the Polaroid enthusiast users, who who's great with the peel apart. I say, what's the normal price for this in a steady state world for a color peel apart four by five, it's single shot in a in a five forty five holder? I haven't gotten an answer yet, but that's mm. a theoretical question. And it's it, and it, it, a box of five or six ought to be thirty nine dollars and ninety five cents. And in Europe, you're going to have to add the VAT. In Asia, you're going to have to add the VAT. But there there has to be a normal price for this. And if and I do I I I have been I have done couponing, but I can't because I can't afford. I need the money to get to the to the financing event. And the lawyer the lawyer the cost of lawyering are enough to choke a horse. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, look. Don't say any more about your new venture. We watch with interest to see how it uh, how it might uh, de- develop, and I'm well, sure with, well, if enthuse yeah. if enthusiasm takes you anywhere, then this is going to be a blinding success. Well, I'll tell you something. I love making the stuff, and when I have to, I've set goals for myself every month and every day. I have to put my hands in the booth and do this, and I have to. The, making it is one thing, but I have to box it and then ship it. And Charles is there twenty hours a week, not quite making pods at a rate that we agree on and he's happy doing that. But that's an automated process that needs to be done by a machine. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I can't talk about list of proceeds from the financing, but the, the, this thing is, is going to be automated. It's going to be gradually the investment in the, in the processes is going to take place to where we have to get to a thousand boxes a month and we have to sell a thousand boxes a month. And that means the price has to be just so, and if we're yeah. going to grow, we're either going to have to grow with internal cash flow or we're going to have to finance that growth. Well, I think folks in the U in the U S I think I saw an email just this week, maybe from you saying you've got free shipping at the moment in the U S so, and the majority of our listeners are in the U S. So if you've never tried, I hope that it's still valid by the time the show airs later today. Well, the end of March. End of end March. March. So, if you've never tried U fifty five, you you need to uh, or, or pos- positive neg material. You need to have yourself one of these five four five holders, and you can get them on eBay, and probably they'll be fine. Um, I've stripped mine down and give it a good clean, and I think you have to leave the lever in a certain position to stop the spring knackering, don't you? Is it in the? Do you leave it in the? If people the, have questions, you know, I'm open to a Skype session. Yeah. Five minutes give you give you the tricks. So get get in touch with Sam. But these things are, certainly the holders are available on Sam's website, or you can get them on the bay, and free shipping in the US. You know, and and help help uh, extend the life of uh, PN material and make it an exciting future. Because I think um, I, for one, certainly uh, um, will be jumping back in on some of this product at some point over the next month or so. Sam, if it's all right with you, we're going to we're, we're just conscious of the time a little bit. I've got to pick my daughter up in in half an hour or so. Uh, we've got a few emails to read. Is that is it sure. is that okay, Simon? We move on to a few emails. Simon, yeah, oh, sorry, <laughs> I made the same mistake as Sam earlier. Yeah, Sam and Simon, very, very pretty pretty close. Yeah, I think that's that, that's a great idea. And um, and Sam, if you if you feel like helping us out with uh, these queries from our guests uh, from our uh, listeners, uh, please please join in. Yeah, well, some so apologies for those who've emailed. Uh, we, we're pretty well. We no, I don't think we can really make an apology. We've had such great guests, and the time just disappears, and we've not organised ourselves to read these things. So we've got a bit of time now. We'll read, see if we can get through some of these. So I, we got an email in January from Paul Barden, and Paul says, "Gentlemen, on the most recent podcast, Max Grew, aforementioned Max Grew from Intrepid." 
mentioned the need for servicemen who can repair shutters as they age. <laughs> Just buy lenses without shutters, uh, Paul, you'll be fine. Shutters are overrated. And he says this will become an increasingly important issue for film photographers as the years go by. What I'd like to mention to you is this. If you've not watched Chris Sherlock's retina repair videos on YouTube, then you may be in for a pleasant surprise. You will certainly learn some things about shutter repairs. And then he gives a link, which I'm not going to read out because it's horrendously long, but I will put it in the show notes. And Paul goes on to say, one and a half years ago, I started following Chris Sherlock's channel with the goal of learning how to disassemble, clean, and restore a retina type 010. I've no idea what a retina type 010 is, but I'll just keep reading. Um, I'd bought from a friend for $25. Chris's videos made it all seem easy, and I successfully stripped down my retina and had it and had it uh, back up and running like a dream with an investment of a few hours of my time. Since then, I've watched most of his tutorials on the many variants of the retina. Oh, it must be the... Is it the Kodak retina camera he's talking about? I don't know. And have uh, sub- it, could be, it could be because those have uh, leaf shutters. Okay, it could well be then. And have subsequently serviced nearly two dozen retinas and their shutters, yeah, it must be, on various models. My point being, anyone... I'm not sure, mate. I'm not sure anyone. Anyone, even a mechanically disinclined novice like myself, can learn to take apart a shutter. Yeah, okay. I'll believe you. Clean it and have it up and running if they find a good tutorial and take the time to follow the instructions to the letter. And I think that's it, finding a good tutorial. You yeah. you know, it's finding one you can trust on YouTube. Um, it, so the, he, he just wraps up by saying the compo shutters in the in the Kodak retinas are very typical of shutter designs. So once you know your way around one of the decal comper shutters, you can figure out most others as well. I think it's important to learn at least basic shutter repair skills if you intend on owning and using large format shutters rather than relying on a shrinking list of skilled repairmen. I can do it, then pretty much. If I can do it, then pretty much. Anyone can, I expect. Regards, and thank you for your good work. Paul Barden, Corvallis, Oregon. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm not sure with people with two left thumbs like me can take apart shutters. Well, I could probably take it apart, yeah, but that's easy I'll, end up, do, yeah. I'll end up with bits all over the place. <laughs> well, the, uh, the key for my... Sorry. No, it's not, in the US, there's still a list of people you could find online. Right. Uh, Grimes, I think, was with, with, with oh, yeah. and they don't yeah. anymore, but they're a very good place for all kinds of machinery for 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 cameras. Still, um, Adam Dow there is excellent. There's a gentleman who's retired uh, in Harrisonburg, Virginia, who will do ILEX shutters, perhaps other kinds. But there's there's there is a case if you're twenty something and looking for something and, and mechanically inclined, you could. Up- study with any any number of these people and it would be a great business for yourself um to to uh collect parts of these compur copal pronto or ilex decal shutters and be the go-to person i'm sure there is room in that market in a new generation for supporting large format photography there you go you heard it here first folks um, can, just I, give us 10% of the revenue and you'll be fine. I can, I've just got to completely agree with uh, what, what just, Sam just said there. Um, and I I mean, I, I know uh, somebody that's capable of uh, repairing old mechanical equipment. And uh, he was telling me that there is an absolutely shrinking number of people that, that are capable of doing that kind of stuff because, you know, frankly – People are dying, and people are, are are retiring before that. But a lot of these people don't retire. Uh, this they, they just still do it, and they do it forever because there are so many people wanting them to do stuff. But there are very few people uh, coming into into camera repairs. Plenty of people coming into repairing plastic cameras, modern digital cameras, and things like that. But one thing that I've I've come to realise is the it's not if you can repair modern digital cameras that doesn't necessarily equip you for repairing old cameras because you're, you're talking digital versus clockwork, you know, and, um, and there are, there are things that you, you learn by taking something apart over a period of years that you recognize a certain feature that, Oh, I think if I undo this screw here, it's going to do X 
or we might do Y, but at least it's going to do one or the other. And if you if you don't have that that knowledge of of clockwork materials and things like that, then you, you're going to struggle with it. So if if there's anybody that is inclined, uh, as Sam was saying, the, um, to the, you know, the, the, you enjoy mechanics and, and, and gears and, and things like that, then the, the industry is crying out for people. And it's not the kind of thing that you can just become uh, a camera repair. It's something that, you know, it's like a good old fashioned apprenticeship really. But mm. there's there's no doubt that if you get into that and you're good at what you're doing, then you, you're made for life uh, because you know, there's, there's so few people in, involved in that now. Can I add one, one more thing about in, in the large format photography context? If, if a young person were to say, I'm just about to receive my Intrepid 4x5 and I'm putting the kit together, what lenses do I need? And the, there's a pretty stock answer for the beginning kit. If, you, if you're sort of a completist and you would want a 90 millimeter lens, you'd want a 150 millimeter lens, you'd want a 120, and you'd have a bag and you'd pretty much be there. The problem in large format is that with that kit, you've got three different shutters each behaving differently. Each one is, yeah. you know, in a different place in it's, it's the arc of its life. So you do want to take all three of the lenses and for a hundred bob, send it to your local lens guy and he'll CLA those shutters and they'll be working just like new and by gum, they will work like, like new and they'll be good for 25 to 50 years and you'll have a good setup. The other way to do it, of course, is to get the full Sinar kit and have a single shutter system on which you pop all these different lens and lens boards. So there's these different ways of doing it. But ma maintenance of shutter, um, I, I, I'm sorry to digress, chaps, but um, the, the, the Hasselblad uh, platform is supported here in Massachusetts by Dave Odess, right? He's one of the last of the brawn trained um, CLA guys for Hasselblad lenses. And in Hasselblad, it's a two and a quarter system, medium format roll film not our domain right but but to have a guy like dave odess who can fix your your backs yeah and all the gearing in it and make sure all your lenses and the shutters are, are firing at the right you know at, in the right to timing and you do want your shutters firing in the right timing when you when you set it at a quarter second you want them all to be firing at a quarter second or it'll throw off your exposures when you're switching lenses so this is just one of those technicalities that you would get covered in a beginner's workshop that's uh, to me interesting anyway. Yeah, and just uh, just another point on there about um, uh, re repairing and servicing a, a shutter and it's as good as new. Well, if that shutter was made 70 years ago, um, there's a reasonable chance when it came out of the factory, it wasn't actually given the speeds it said it was on the, on the label. So th th there's something to be said about learning your equipment as well. And, and you can hear this, the, if you set the thing to a one second, everyone more or less can figure out what a second is. And, and, and there's, a, there's a sound the shutter makes. Most Copal shutters go, bzzz, zip. <laughs> and they all, and, and, and you know what a second is. And especially if you're a musician, you'll have the ability to say, well, wait, was that two seconds? I'm overexposed. Yeah. And sometimes they jam right in the middle of the exposure. And you, and you can tell by using your ears. So photography, manual photography, uh, demands um, involvement from all your senses. I have to say, I've got um, those, I haven't got quite those three lenses that you suggested. I'd got a, a 90, a 150, and a 210, maybe. Maybe that's what you said. I can't remember now. I think it's a 210. Yeah. And I've, uh, I just busily swapped them from one to the other. And, uh, well, um, I never thought about that, really, um, uh, getting them serviced. Maybe I should. Well, well, well when somebody um, uh, app comes on the forum or Facebook and says, why is my – I'm underexposing this, or I'm overexposing always this, and, and, and you have to put on your deerstalking cap mm. and sort of Sherlock Holmes and, and figure out, oh, and you find, you, de you deduce that it's, it's all, the, all the exposures they're taking with the 210 lens. Yeah. It's okay well, if you're just using the one lens and shutter, isn't it? But – as soon as you yeah. yeah it's it's one of those wrinkles that that we encounter and where it's a luxury of, of multiple shutters yeah. maybe does your um your go-to man um, cla large format shutters simon uh he has done in the past but the the problem at the moment is just inundated with work yeah so you know you drop something in now and it's going to be a case of how many months is it going to take before he gets a chance to even look at it 
I think Lyndon um, in Londinium cameras would do it because he's uh, whenever I've sent him a camera, he's he's freed up and CLA'd all the shutters on yeah. several cameras. So Lyndon, oh, yeah. if you if you get mail from some of these CLA people and say I I do it, I'm over here in Swindon. Uh, <laughs> why don't you put up a list of links for the next uh, at the beginning? Of the next yeah. Month? Yeah, I think uh, it, we'll perhaps start a thread on the on the group about repair guys. I think um, yeah. it's, good, good it's thing probably with... been it's probably been done elsewhere, but yeah. not on our group. Yeah, there's no yeah. Real harm. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> Shutter service. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we have a guy down in um, uh, Devon, uh, Linden, uh, called Londinium Cameras. Confusing because he's not in London, and he's he's a great guy, and uh, he's. You know, he can't do everything, but he does a lot, and um, well, the, yeah, yeah, it, and he's very, he's very reasonable. Well, there, it's not like walking into the record store on Carmine Street and being greeted by the hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the the good thing about Linden, Linden is that yeah, you, know, you get in touch with him and you have the conversation because there are things that mm. he will do and there are things that he won't do, and it's yeah. as simple as that. And then there might be something. Well, I'll give it a go and see what happens. So you, you know what you're getting when you uh, when you're dealing with London. I think that's really good. Um, yeah, you do. And uh, just just thinking, you started there with Paul, but actually we have two emails from Jeremy North because I don't think we did the I original. I've got it first. in my hand. Oh, you're doing them both at the same time, are you? Well, uh, there's one wishing us happy new year. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's one where he actually says something interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I'll let you get on with those. Then. Okay. Well, so he says here on the 17th of January, four mentioned uh, Jezza said, "Chaps, I forgot to ask about something else in my last in my email last week, which I think was the one where he just wishes us happy new year." No, well, happy new year. No, it, it it isn't. That's the thing. There Isn't is it? there okay. is actually it's it's lenses and holes, and I don't think we've done that one. Oh, lenses and holes. I didn't. I, I haven't got that printed out. Okay. Well, let me just start with this one, and then if I can find lenses with holes. Oh no, I've got it here. Yeah. Lenses with holes. Yeah. Okay. So reading them chronologically, on the Saturday, the eleventh of January, which is after he wished us Happy New Year, he says, um, "Chaps." Now that I've joined the ranks of large format users, yeah, but you can't you can't spell Scheinflug, can you, Jeremy? Um, I have some questions. It's about lens boards and the sizes of mounting holes and lenses. So Jeremy goes on to say, I have four lenses, two of which are already mounted on boards. They are a Schneider one fifty five six. Yeah, I have that. And a Rodenstock Grandagon 96.3. So those two lenses, the Schneider and the Rodenstock, are both mounted on boards. Then I have two rather old-looking lenses, a Kodak Ektar 203 7.7, which is marked Mount 370 on an Epsilon shutter. And the other is a Mayer Gorlitz. <laughs> yeah, and Stigmat Trio Plan, thirteen cent, thirteen point five centimeter f four point five, and that one has a shutter marked Ipsor DRP. The Kodak lens is smaller in diameter than the others, certainly less than the Copal sizes I found online. It's about thirty two millimeters. I read somewhere that most lenses will mount to most other shutters, but that doesn't seem possible. Can you elucidate? Hmm. Don't know. Can I? Well, let's let's, let's, let's go through all, all the way through the email and then let's see where we... Where By we... the way, are either of these two old lenses decent? Uh, I think he means the... So that's the uh, Kodak Ektar 203. Yes. And the Mayer Gollitz Trioplan. Yes. 13.5. Well, we've got a yes from Sam. I have another. Well, the, do you want me? To, here's another question. But should I just leave that for the moment? No, no. Let's go, let's go through. Right. Them, we'll I have go. another question. The old Linhoff camera I have is, I think, a Technica three, which has been modified with a five by four back. Um. So what? Yeah, okay. I also have what I think was the original back, which, after some research, appears to be nine by twelve. Okay. Yeah. Do you know anything about that format? Is it totally obsolete? Uh, thanks for a great show. I've been listening since episode one. 
but until now, not felt worthy to write in. Well, it doesn't normally stop you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> so on that last point, 9 by 12 there's quite a lot of 9 by 12 plate cameras on eBay. Yeah, I know that um, Jason Bud Lane does offer sheet film in 9 by 12 And Jason, yeah, I think, makes plates as well. What? Je- sorry, Jason, I think, makes sheet, uh, plates for 9 by 12 I'm sure he does. Uh, and of course, Jason's willing to custom make because everyone's plate holders could be could be non custom. So, yeah, the answer is yes, but you'd be limited in the, in the film stocks you could use. Um, nine by twelve. I mean, are you shooting with um, dark, double dark slide holders or what kind of? Interface well, he is now because he's got it converted to a five by four by the sounds of it. So, yeah. so he's off. He's away. He's getting Ilford and Kodak film without yeah. being too hard. So there is 9 by 12 there, There's a lot of cameras on eBay with 9 by 12 and I think yeah, you can certainly yeah. shoot plates. Yeah, and for the tried, the, you know, dyed the wool hobbyist or serious, insane person, you can cut down film. Yeah. You, you, X-ray film you can cut down. Well, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a, as much a camera fetishist as anyone in large format, and we all are to some degree. The cameras that I think are really interesting are these these um, the t- Tropen, the German, the, the Dresden made um, uh, the the Clack cameras, the little four by the little large format cameras where they had like medium format sheet film holders um, for portability, and they were used by police and other things. And I forget the name um, Ernemann, the two ends. And they, they're these delightfully, you know, dovetail joined, like, you know, a bit like the Graflex if you peel off the skin. But um, beautifully made things out of teak wood and, and brass, but really durable. And they have, like, you know, if you're going to collect and shoot seriously, uh, there's a few examples of photographers like this. You could end up with, with, with a cutter in a, in, a, in, a, in a dark bag or in a dark closet or bathroom. <laughs> and you're cutting down your film because you've jigged it out. So some people, you know, you, they're, they're, you never say die is what I always say. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, just just going back, and, and Sam's already um, given this thumbs up for the uh, the Ektar and the Trier plan, which I'm doing as well. Um, I don't really know too much about either of those two lenses specifically, in, uh, but um, I mean, I certainly know about Trier plans in, in smaller formats, but it's a it's a different uh, a different beast up in, in large format. But the other thing, though, when as soon as you see Kodak Ektar on the lens, that just usually means it's a good lens. It's a, it's almost mm. like a default answer. I don't think there are any bad Kodak Ektar lenses out there because they were in the day they were all, to my knowledge, they were all top lenses. I believe. Um, one of the things I tell the kids and in the workshops, I say, look, the equipment is important. Get good stuff that you can trust and rely on, and that you can carry. But the lens isn't going to do the work of selecting the position you're in when you press the shutter and it's not going to decide for you what is an interesting subject and all of that. I mean, also when you say decent, it depends what you want to do with your lens. Do you, do you want to, I mean, if it, it might render subjects, you know, in a, in a fairly crappy way, but that might be what you're after. So, you know, if, if, if you're getting the results you want, Jeremy, with that particular lens, um, then that's great. It's good, isn't it? Well, that's- think, yeah, yeah. There's nothing you can learn uh, uh, from a conversation or a or a, or a podcast that you, that you can't better learn from making a dozen exposures. Well, the the bit that we might be able to help him with is these these two lenses are odd sized uh, by mm. the sounds of it, and so it's it's how does he actually manage to use these lenses? Um, because it sounds like they're not. They're not well. I don't know about the trier plan, but um, certainly the there's a good chance that the the Ektar lens is not using one of the Copal sizes. <clears throat> so I think did the Kodak have their own sizes back in the day? Uh, perhaps you might know a bit more about this, Sam. Uh, no, not particularly. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I get I get the feeling um, they had their own sizing system. So, well, they're Kodak, so they probably did. You know, I think the the um, question was was framed in the context of uh, non-standard lens boards and holes. And I think that if somebody is a large format photographer and is reasonably handy about the house and has a drill press in their basement, they know what a spade bit is and they know how you drill a hole in a, in a, in a lens board 
And a lot of us end up doing that kind of thing and buying well. the buying the rings to fix the lens on the board and you end up sort of being you're hacking these things with a chisel or whatever it is. Yeah, I've been doing exactly that. In fact there's a thread on the large format photography podcast Facebook group all about cutting holes in lens boards. Or yeah, Simon yeah. if you're Simon you just print it on his three D printer. Yeah. Or, well it's, it becomes a thing when you get interested in lenses and you're curious as to what a Meyer Gorlitz does, or yeah. let's say an Aero Ektar or, or a, da, a Dalmeyer Pentac. You know, these what's a flat view? What's a what what is what is a 300 millimeter process lens with the, with the Tessar derivative? What does it do for a landscape? Yeah. Or what does a flat field lens do to in rendering a landscape that was a lens that was designed to to fly in a B-29 bomber and take the piece of a land from 30,000 feet. Yeah. Um, that's, those are interesting questions and you're going to have to kind of get the shovel and, and you get the gloves on and chip away at some wood or metal to, to get it on your, to, to fit it. If, unless you're wealthy and you just, so I think boards and holes are over overcomable, solvable problem, but he does say, I read somewhere that most lenses will mount on most other shutters, but that doesn't seem possible. That doesn't, no. I can't see that as being true. No, no. no he's, ah, yeah. And, and, and to be honest, I think I didn't really rep, um, uh, preface myself pro- properly. I was talking more about actually, because I wasn't sure if these, these lenses actually were with shutters and it's, um, and it's putting these lenses yeah. with other shutters can be, uh, can be a bit tricky and again that's where those odd sizes start to come in yeah. the other thing you come to learn in this is if you have uh let's say a four by five uh rail camera kit and you have three or four lenses your copal shutters if you had all copal shutters which is a good idea to have all the same vintage copal shutter all the knobs and switches are in the same place so you can you can actually operate them without looking at them yeah right you go from one lens to the other but what you have is the different focal lengths of lenses demand a different size shutter aperture and copal has copal zero copal one copal three and they are you know characterized by their size and also by their top shutter speeds and their designs and so there's this is a this is a stand a world of de, de facto standard and if you're dealing with lenses from different generations you're going to get all kinds of uh differences and that's just something we live with and it's something that makes it quite interesting yeah, yeah. absolutely i'm uh, andrew I'm, I'm just thinking now I, yeah we, we're we, not going to read i'm not going to yeah. read anymore so if, yes <laughs> if you sent an email in and, and there's jeremy has got another one that I, I can't read now yeah and christopher j may i've got one here from him and also bob matter Bass Sorry, well. Bob, and yeah, but so you're just going to have to li- listen again to maybe next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we'll, we we'll, we will we will do the emails on there. So uh, we're just we're just going to be a little bit tight on time today. So I think we um, need to start to uh, wind things down for the for the sake of uh, the the child that you need to pick up, or it's not a child anymore. Well, she was a ch- she is my child, but she's a grown child now. That, that's mm. it. So um, Sam. Um, it's been great having you on the show. Um, and how can we've talked about your website a few times and things like that, but how, how can people follow the kind of things you do? And, um, and if you want to buy things from, uh, from you and all that kind of stuff, what, how, how can we send those people to you? The, the store is at famousformat.com, famousformat.com. And you can find the menu system and find the shop. And that's where the film is available and some of the other products. I uh, personally, Samuel West Heiser, is where I post things on Facebook, some of which are, you know, if I could stop posting political stuff, I, I would post photography stuff. But I put photography things there, too. Um, we have an Instagram page, new55film at Instagram, where you'll see what we're doing. And if you search Instagram for the hashtag new55film, you'll see what others are doing, too. And it's fairly lively thread uh, to see what people do. And p- if you're curious as to what is the quality of the print, go to Instagram is a good way to look that up. Um, but um, uh, I thank you, uh, Simon uh, and Andrew. I, I've enjoyed every minute of this and look forward to perhaps another if, if, if it's warranted. But um, more than that, uh, seeing you at a, over some coffee or something, uh, something stronger. <laughs> that would be great. In the fans. 
<laughs> or even, or even, in, or even in the Forest of Dean at the end of May. Uh, so we need to quickly you know, uh, touch upon that, Isle, don't we, Andrew? Even the Isle of Dogs will do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you're, um, if you, if you want to get down with the cool cats, that's me and Simon and some others. <laughs> Ooh, boy. <laughs> uh, you can join us at the last weekend in uh, May, which is 28th, 29th, 1st of June, that sort of weekend. Um, Saturday, I think, is when Saturday evening is when we're all going to uh, drink some adult beverages and yeah, third, 30th coffee. of May. That's a Saturday. Isn't it? Yeah, well, that, of May. Don't work, don't bother me with the details. It's somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm going to be there on the Friday, and I know Steve Segersby is going to be there on the Friday as well. Um, there's going to be a few large format curious attending as well. I think Jimmy Hickford might be coming, uh, a couple of other curious large format people coming. Although Jimmy Hickford now has his first camera, so I have a lot of time for people interested in getting into it, and uh, I think I think we should we should do that and make sure that people feel welcome and, and also women feel welcome in, in the field. Yeah, well, I'm bringing a woman with me, so um, you've got to have somebody to do the cooking. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> She's not, she doesn't listen to this show. No, no. Um, yeah. So, so the best, the, the best photographs by far are the ones coming from our, our, our female users and there's absolutely there's the of the field. Well, on that on that subject, so I'm going to do a quick shout out uh, to previous guest, episode twenty. Kate Miller Wilson mm. has got some amazing photographs out at the moment. So, I mean, everybody should be following her on Instagram uh, anyway. But there's a an article that she's written for Petapixel that came out, uh, I think, last week. I think or earlier this week, where she's uh, using static electricity to shock her negatives and then shooting over them. Uh, to do double exposures and, and she's doing some amazing self-portrait work uh, with these what appear like lightning uh, we know, take all the, we take all the credit for it don't we as well yes it's it's basically she she came to us and she was inspired and, and then went on to do even more amazing stuff so uh, yeah it was our electric personality that sent her <laughs> off down that path exactly exactly so uh, so Kate um, that's 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 a that's a quick shout out there because she's doing some incredible stuff at the moment um and and see them on on the roll with their shout outs i just want to uh uh say uh, give a shout out to the Ho homemade camera podcast again um because their current episode which is episode 44 has uh, i'm going to claim uh, this person as our own just like i've claimed kate um our very own sandea lynch uh, is the guest on that show and mm -hmm. it's a fascinating listen. Um, so uh, it, it talks in depth about the many uh, cameras that he's made and you know how he came to make those decisions as to why he does things in different in different ways and so on. And also just he's an interesting guy and he's, he's led a very interesting life and you get to hear a little bit more of it. Uh, yeah, he wouldn't, we so. couldn't get him to talk about that too much. So I've not listened to that episode yet. So, but even, even spending an evening with him in a pub in Wales, I couldn't get him to really open up about... Uh, his, uh, his past, which I think is quite interesting by from some of the things he hinted at. That's it. And uh, very, very quickly, uh, you can catch up with Andrew and I very, very soon on uh, Saturday the 14th of March, but we will be at the photography show. Um, mm. That's a four-day event. That's the second of the four days, so it runs from the 14th to the 17th. Uh, that's at the Birmingham NEC. Um, and if you're interested, and you should be, uh, the Sunday 16 podcast are doing a live podcast show after the event closes on that saturday so if you wish to go to that um, then you need to go on the online to wherever you get the tickets from and sign up for for that show it's free you don't to, well you, you've got to pay to go into the uh, the main event but it's the actual podcast itself is free so uh, but you have to register for it because you'll still be in there when everybody's being kicked out so yeah you have to get a ticket i've got my ticket i've printed it off earlier and now i've lost it but i've yeah. got a ticket somewhere that's it Can I shout to somebody yeah yeah i was well to be, to be fair so i was i was going to come back to you but go go for it now. please come back when you when when you're ready i don't want it oh okay no, no, well, good. okay well what well, one more, one more for, for me, then I'm done. Um, and that's to say that uh, Hamish Gill's Pixelator is finally finished, and that is actually going to start going out. And uh, and that's just for those people who don't know about it. It's a way of digitising film. It's an easy way of digitising film, and uh, and it's uh, a 
translucent uh, piece of plastic with some gates and things that fold over the top of it which allow you to um, digitize different sizes of film up to four by five so uh, that's that's just about to go out and if anybody's interested in digitizing film in general uh, we've got uh, Hamish coming on to the Classic Lenses podcast on st- Monday, uh, along with uh, Nate Johnson, I think his name is. He's the guy behind uh, Negative Lab Pro, which is a plugin for Lightroom, which does an incredible job of uh, of um, taking negatives into, into positives, especially in colour. It works great in black and white, but the getting um, negative negative colour shots to look right. Uh, digitally is very very tricky it's not easy to print either for that matter um, so yeah we'll be talking about those about those things on Monday on the Classic Lenses podcast so uh, mm. okay so that, that, that's that, that's my shout out so let's let's head over to Sam and uh, if you want to have any shout outs you want to give well there's too many people to mention but I want to say thank you to Charles Fenrock my my colleague and to Bob Crowley for I curse him for starting this thing off but um there's two books that I would find uh, I would like to recommend to either beginners or, or people who are, who are falling or deeply into large format. And one book's called Dialogue with Photography. This is a book of interviews of photographers by the interviews are by Paul Hill and the, the, the photographs are by uh, Thomas Joshua Cooper. If you don't recognize the name, he's running the photo program up at the Glasgow School of Art and a fantastic seascape photographer in his own right. The other book is uh, The Ongoing Moment by Jeff Dyer. Yep, got uh, it and read it. Yeah. If you caught that, your world has been enlarged um, mm. for very little money. But um, I have to say our, to our initial um, supporters, uh, including Andrew Bartram, <laughs> uh, there's Tobias Feltis, there's Alan Crooks, Peter DeGroote, who sadly is no longer with us, Doc Caps, whose inspiration helped us um, and of course, John Ruder and Ted McClellan and Nafiz Assad, their uh, original generosity uh, put us uh, in place uh, uh, to get the Kickstarter done. But Catherine Just, Stefan Milev, um, David Bailey, uh, Oliver Bracott, uh, Bridget Niedermeyer, Nick Carver, Kyle Gostinger, Lena Wilder, without these kinds of photographers, we wouldn't have feel the need to bother. Thank you all. Excellent. And uh, Andrew, any any shout outs for you? Uh, well, uh, if it's the same Nick Carver, uh, I follow Nick on YouTube. I follow a few folks on YouTube and Nick has a great YouTube channel. I like his humor. Um, his method of delivery has grown and he's as he's got more confident and mature and uh, he does uh, he does some great uh, YouTube videos. So if, if that indeed is the same Nick Carver, um, if not, Look up Nick Carver, photographer on YouTube. <laughs> PN, PN session brewing, which is an, another uh, uh, very exciting thing. His, the fact that Nick reveals his mistakes is, is is probably the most unique and helpful thing on on YouTube. Yeah, he's very good. Right. That's it. Okay. Um, just uh, very. How, how many how many seconds have we got left, Andrew? Um, well, my daughter messaged me a little while ago saying she was on time, so you're okay for five minutes or so. Okay, well then that gives me <laughs> just enough time to say thank you to our the our coffee donation the uh, donors, yeah. uh, because I don't think we did it last week, and I can't. Three remember. weeks ago, yeah. certainly didn't do it last week. No, no. So I'm going to go uh, go from 31st of January. Um, and Gretchen, uh, thank you for thank you for doing what you do. Gretchen said, um, Silist um I've, I've read that name out a few times i'm beginning to be able to pronounce it now um he donated to us and uh, so thank you there and, and he says enjoy and we we will um mark fole uh keep up the good work simon and andrew thank you mark i uh, really appreciate mm-hmm. it there and christopher j may um uh, really enjoyed last last la- the last episode guys and uh, and so did we and that was the uh, the Travis uh, Linville episode so uh, thank you very very much uh, Christopher again um, right so um, Andrew mm. how can people keep up with you outside of this show they can follow me on most social media platforms as Warboys Snapper 
um, on Instagram, certainly. And if you're interested in my pinhole output, that's Warboys Snapper underscore pinhole. You can catch me every two weeks also on the Lensless podcast with Kari Cannon. Um, we have a new show going out this Sunday. And, of course, on the Facebook group, the Large Format Photography Facebook group, which has now surpassed the numbers of the Lensless podcast. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not, not that we're actually that interested in numbers. It's more no, we're not. It's uh, more about no, the we quality do. of the people. Yes, and um, most people who apply to join, uh, if they answer the question and we like the cut of their jib, um, they'll... Uh, They'll get in. We don't have any. Um, we don't have any nastiness, as far as I can tell. We're, Simon and I are quite active on the group. It's very engaging. So if you if you don't do Facebook, uh, we totally understand that. But the Facebook groups I find uh, to be generally uh, really very helpful places in a way that Flickr used to be uh, five, uh, six, seven years ago. Here, here. Sad about Flickr. Though. Yeah, I'm so, I noticed you had a site, well, still have a site, Sam. I, I can't work out at the moment whether it's still active or not. Are you updating it? Well, there's some yeah. stuff on there. Yeah. But we, you know, I think this is, since we've gone down for the count, web services have evolved another plateau. So I'm, I'm looking forward to pulling it all back together with, with, with a hierarchy that makes some sense. And we'll use the soft social media platforms that we that, that work the best and not use the ones that we don't want to promote mm-hmm. all right gotta go yeah well uh, just very very quickly then um thank you again sam it's been great having you on yeah thanks sam simon andrew thank you so much That's it's it. been a pleasure to be in your space and in your world and thank you for what you do this is a terrific podcast thank, thank you too and uh for me um you can get you can catch up with the kind of things I do on Twitter as Simon4. On Instagram as Simon Force to Photographic. We do sort of have an Instagram account, um, which is the same as the name of the uh, the podcast, Large Format Large Format Photography Podcast, which um, is yeah, we'll we'll get using that one properly at some point. Um, if you want to write into us or email us, uh, we have the uh, our email address is large format photography podcast at gmail.com we've already talked about the facebook group you can catch me every week on the classic lenses podcast which goes out on the monday um let's just say thank you to kevin mcleod of incompetech.com uh, for for our incredible theme music which is called two finger johnny um so that's it so i hope you've enjoyed the, the podcast and it'd be great if you can join us again next time goodbye bye bye